All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Humanities and Social Science Google Hangout for Princeton University. Uh, we're here to welcome the class of 2020 uh, and hopefully answer any questions that you may have within this field. Um, so tonight we have uh, four wonderful panelists, uh, current stu students here um, at Princeton who are involved in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, so in a moment we will introduce them. Uh, so th what the program will look like tonight, essentially if you have uh, the Q&A portion pulled up of the uh, Google Hangout, uh, you can essentially just post uh, a question that you may have. There's a, a voting system uh, that you can um, star the ones you like and those will rise to the top. We'll try to get through as many of the questions as we can tonight. We're going to aim for about 45 minutes um, tonight. and. Uh, but if you do have more questions, uh, you're more than free to call into the admission office uh, or write into our email address at uaoffice at princeton.edu. Um, but uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Pat Rounds. I'm an admission officer. I'm also a member of the, cl uh, the class of 2015. I studied at the Woodrow Wilson School and got a certificate in theater. Um, so jumping right into it, uh, Alex, uh, Carolyn, Jake, and Elisa will introduce themselves, and we can jump right into the questions. So, um, Alex, if you'd like to start. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Alex Quadrado. I'm a member of the class of 2016, so I'm a senior this year. I'm in the Italian department, uh, which is really great, and I have two certificates, one in medieval studies and the other in interdisciplinary humanities, um, which allows me to really branch out into history, religion, and all the humanities. Um, I'm from a small town in Colorado, and a lot of the things I like to do outside of class include hiking, I play the guitar, um, I love skiing. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so let's move on to Carolyn. Hi, uh, my name is Carolyn Beard. I'm a sophomore, so I'm a member of the class of 2018. I'm an independent concentrator in the humanities, and I'm getting certificates or minors in German, Latin, and Greek. Um, so outside of the classroom, I'm on the women's rugby team. I'm involved in Christian and interfaith life on campus, as well as debate, politics, journalism, and theater. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, let's move on to Jake. Jake. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Jake. I'm a junior in the class of 2017 from New York City. Uh, I'm getting. Uh, I'm studying anthropology with a certificate in global health and health policy. Uh, outside of the classroom, I am involved as an orange key tour guide, giving tours to prospective students and visitors. I'm the technical director of one of our student-run theaters on campus and do a lot with technical theater in other ways. Um, I also work here uh, in the ticket office um, to do some, some student employment as well. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Jake. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Elisa. Hi, I'm Elisa. I'm a senior in the English department, and I'm getting a minor or certificate in visual arts. So writing and art. I, um, I grew up in Hawaii, but my family's lived abroad a bunch, so a little bit of the Middle East, Singapore, and currently Indonesia. Um, I am studying a said English and a visual arts certificate, so outside of class, um, I do a lot of things in terms of design, especially um, digital illustration and some freelance illustration as well. Um, and then my other big thing is with the Christian Ministry Princeton Evan Evangelical Fellowship, um, so I'm involved um, with a whole bunch of services and um, fellowship there as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. And without further ado, um, let's jump right into the questions. So we have uh, Zi Zhang who asks um, about the individual experience in the humanities and social sciences. So they ask uh, in terms of the classes, how they're structured, uh, what the assignment's like, and if there is a lot of freedom for self-exploration. So if any of you guys would like to speak on any of those topics, please feel free to jump right in. Sure, I'll speak about the different kinds of classes here at Princeton. Um, they really range. I've had classes where I'm one of three people. Um, I've also had larger lectures. And the size of the class will definitely determine the experience of the class. And it's not that one is better than the other. They're just very different experiences. In a small uh, seminar, you really have the opportunity to connect on a real level with your professors. And I'd say there's a lot of room for exploration in seminars because you get to work out 
a project that you might want to work on as your final paper. Um, lectures tend to be more, lecture classes tend to be more structured, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't um, branch out into whatever your interests may be. Fantastic. Does anyone have anything to add? Yeah. Um, sure. Um, I think. Sorry. Uh, to really agree with what Alex said about that. Um, speaking directly from the anthropology department and the social sciences, um, I think all almost all of my classes have been seminar based, and it's been you know maybe about 15, 20 students that get together twice a week for like an hour and a half with the professor. Uh, we really get a chance to engage with the reading. Um, there's a lot of room to question the reading. Um, sort of think outside the box, and there's also a lot of room for self-exploration. Um, with anthropology specifically, um, most of my classes have given us the opportunity to do our own ethnographies of Princeton, um, so we sort of figure out what part of campus we are most interested in studying, and we get a chance to develop our own projects around that. Um, I've worked with the Community-Based Learning Initiative to do um, sort of independent final projects with the community in, in the Mercer County area, um, so there's a lot of room, especially I think in final assignments, to branch out um, and figure out what is most interesting to you that's also relevant to the class that you're taking. Yeah, so it, totally just picking backing um, off of those responses. So I've noticed self-exploration and like self-discovery in two ways uh, mm -hmm. in the classroom. So one, just in writing papers. So I know in high school often like midterm papers or final papers there would be a prompt and you'd be expected to write about that prompt. Here at Princeton that's not the case. So you'll have a class, and then the professor will assign a midterm paper or final paper, and maybe the professor will give some guiding ideas. Uh, but more, but what's most likely is that uh, they'll just have like an open-ended uh, opportunity to research whatever you want to research. So that could um, come from a topic that you talked about in class, come from a reading, or just come from something completely out of left field, but that's still relevant to the coursework. And then additionally, on top of that, I know I'm an independent concentrator here at Princeton. So I took a class I really loved, I wanted to expand it into a concentration, and I've been able to do that. Yeah, and going off of all that, which is all true, um, I found especially doing the major where you have like a set amount of courses that they want you to take by the end of your graduation, but within that set they'll have sort of categories, at least this is true for English, it's probably similar for other departments, they'll have categories of certain like time periods or um, people or yeah, just different areas within the requirement, but within that there's such a range um, of just courses that you can take, um, sort of tailoring, it's not like all English majors will take the exact same courses, but you can really tailor it to what kind of scholar and thinker that you are. I've taken everything from like a Milton course, to currently I'm in a class called Children's Literature, so we're just, we've just read The Giver and we're reading Hunger Games a little later and some Harry Potter. Um, so very much even within the course, um, the courses themselves, you just scroll through the selection, this is, yeah, very much a process of um, self-exploration. All right. Well, those are some great responses. Thanks, guys. Uh, so let's move. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, move on to the next question. Uh, so the next question asks um, that uh, many freshmen take the writing seminar. Uh, how does that contribute to your major choice? Uh, is the seminar tied? Oh, uh, is the seminar tied to your course of study? Uh, so if anyone wants to take that up. Sure. <laughs> I'll jump right in. Um, so, yes, all freshmen take the writing seminar um, in both the engineering school and um, AB students. Everyone um, gets signed up for the writing seminar either in the fall or the spring, and you get to rank what topics you, you might want to take the writing seminar in. The one I took was called The Art of Adventure. And we read Don Quixote, we read The Tempest, and then we got to do a final paper that was really on whatever you wanted it to be related to the class. Um, and for me, the seminar was very tied to my course of study. My final paper for writing seminar um, actually has a lot to do with my current senior thesis. Um, wow. But yeah, it, I mean, but that, as you can see, that doesn't always happen, nor does it need to happen. Um, uh, I guess what I'm saying is there's definitely the opportunity that you love some of the material in your writing seminar and decide to run with that. Yeah, kind of as an anecdote going off of that, 
I know I was really upset uh, with the writing seminar that I got. I really wanted a seminar about religion uh, because that was what my perspective concentration was when I came to Princeton, and I didn't get it, and it wouldn't work with my schedule, and it wasn't possible for me to get into it. I was so bummed, uh, but I ended up being assigned a writing seminar called Preserving the Past, and I ended up having a really great professor. She's a very close mentor to this day, and I actually became really interested then in like historical preservation and in world heritage sites, and similarly to Alex, that's actually being incorporated into my independent work, and that's a field that I may be interested in going into in the future. Um, so in some ways, it's actually best if your writing seminar doesn't um, so closely align with your perspective field of study because you may find that you actually like whatever you're studying in that writing seminar. Yeah, I think I would very much have to agree with what Carolyn just said. I actually came into Princeton thinking I was going to major in molecular biology um, and now I'm an anthropology major. Uh, and so when I was taking a writing seminar course, I was actually thinking nothing about the sciences. Um, I ended up taking one in Utopias, Dystopias, and Manifestos. And so we were reading uh, and looking at literature surrounding that, and um, that was a great chance to sort of explore something that I had not had a lot of exposure to, um, and I really wanted to sort of use this class as a way to gain new interest, and I think that's definitely one opportunity you have with that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm an English major, and it's a writing sem, so I guess those are related in that. Topically wise, topically, I'm not sure if I really pursued things that were in my writing sem, but I do know that a lot of, a lot of students don't necessarily follow things that I found in that writing sum. Um, but I do know that in terms of just the skill set that it gives to every single freshman that's coming through in terms of, like, this is how you can really read a text well, and this is how you can really think and process and be able to express that really well. Um, and I'm sure every, all you 2020s are really good writers, um, but it's just really nice to have um, that sort of foundation because writing will be such a part of your um, four years. Um, so it's really nice to have that environment that's made specifically for freshmen um, to be able to grow in that. All right, awesome. All right, thanks guys. Um, so <clears throat> our next question comes from uh, Raphael and he has a question uh, r with regards to uh, grading in the humanities departments at Princeton uh, and he asks if there are, uh, he mentions uh, that grade deflation is discontinued do the humanities departments still set quotas as far as how many A's or B's can be awarded? Um, and if you guys could also perhaps uh, go f from that, also talk about uh, how the courses are set up, um, you know, seminars, precepts, if you've had them, uh, and just how what, what it looks like to be in a class uh, at Princeton. I think uh, in my experience with my humanities and social science classes, I really, I think generally at Princeton, I don't think I've ever really experienced um, what was like the old grading policy. Um, I think that based on the work and the effort that I put into a course, it really reflected the grade that I got. And I think that really just pushed me to work really hard in my classes. And I think with the new grading policy, I mean, departments have a little more flexibility in deciding on their own policies, and I think that sort of will still hold true, though, is um, really putting in the work um, will get you the grade that you deserve. Um, they're not trying to hurt you in any way. Um, but speaking a little to the, like, how the classes look, um, with the, the seminars, usually I've had seminars like twice a week um, for an hour and a half, um, and that's like, fully discussion-based. The professor might speak for the first few minutes to introduce or contextualize the topic, and then we'll jump right into discussion. Um, but with lecture classes when I've had precepts, which are, I think, like smaller breakout discussions, the chance to really dive into the material in a more personalized setting, um, those will meet once a week for an hour and 20 minutes for 50 minutes, and those really are a great way to supplement the lecture. Um, and those preceptors who might be professors or grad students, um, they're very helpful in addressing any concerns that you might have about the course. So I've had a great experience with both, both styles of learning so far. Yeah, I've never felt like I've gotten a grade that I haven't because of um, any sort of grade structure within it, so I can't really speak to that. Maybe they have that going on, but I feel that, um, at least in the classes and departments that I've been in, it's been very true to the work you put in is sort of what um, you get out. And I've also felt, which has been really cool, that I've never felt that the classmates that I'm um, in precept with or in lecture with, like I don't feel like I need to 
push you guys all out. Um, and even sort of how your finals, a lot of them will be papers, so it's not like a grade in terms of numerically graded. And I never feel, when I talk about my work with my friends, it's not like their great idea is going to take away from my great idea, um, which I think is a really, um, in terms of grades, it's just like a really healthy environment to be in. So. I'd, I'd agree with that. I've never gotten a grade at Princeton that I didn't feel I deserved. Um, and that what that means is when you do get an A, you're thrilled. And you, <laughs> like, it, it, you know you deserve that A. And if it's the best feeling in the world to know that you deserved an A at Princeton. And it's, um, it is, I think it's a really great shift from high school where I think many of us were used to a, a different style of grading. And I, I think more than the grade, the best thing that a professor gives me when he or she get, hands the paperback is the feedback in the margins. Yeah. For sure. Um, something also just kind of going off of this question, talking about like learning in the classroom, learning outside of the classroom is just as important, if not more important, and it's something that you'll actually hear like administration and faculty say when you get on campus. And that blew my mind when I got here and heard those people saying that. But it's really true. Um, here at Princeton, you will learn so much from the conversations that you have in office hours with your professors. So every professor at Princeton is required to have office hours for undergraduate students. So you can make an appointment or you can just stop by and talk with your professor or talk with a professor you don't even have in class. Um, similarly, just sitting at meals with friends um, and with new friends and talking about philosophy, about language and religion. Um, joining new activities, continuing old activities, these are all the ways that you can learn at Princeton outside of the classroom. Absolutely. And one of the professors I've now become closest with, I haven't, I wasn't in a class with him until this semester, and I'm a senior. It's spring. Um, but I've known him for three years, and we just get coffee all the time. And we, we sit down and talk about books. And it's but Tony Grafton is his name. He used to be the president of the American Historical Association. This is a big shot. And he takes time away from his classes, his assigned students, to speak to students like me who had never taken a class with him. Um, I really think Princeton fosters that kind of intellectual friendship, not only among students, uh, not only among faculty, but across those lines. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, guys. Th those were some fantastic answers. Um, so the next question we are going to move on to uh, comes from Carlos, and he asks, uh, what do most people in the social sciences do post-graduation? And since that's kind of a, a general question, I know we have two seniors on the panels. Um, so if you, uh, seniors, if you do have plans already, uh, what, what you're considering doing, uh, and otherwise, uh, Carolyn and uh, Jake, I know this is early on, uh, but perhaps ideally what you'd be uh, doing after Princeton. Uh, sure. I, um, I will be attending Columbia uh, to get a PhD in Italian literature. Aww. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am employed, which is exciting. Um, I'm doing a Project 55 fellowship, which is through Princeton. It's the class of 1955 established a fellowship to place Princeton graduates at nonprofits. So I'm actually going to be in the Princeton area. I'll be 10 minutes away at um, a nonprofit called International School Services, which is pretty relevant to my background, so I'm excited for that. And I will be a communications fellow, so I think it's going to be a range of some writing, reporting, social media, design. Um, and then on the side, I plan to keep freelance illustrating. So. There is, there is light. <laughs> um, so I've actually, I've known what I've wanted to do professionally since I was about 13. Um, that's very uncommon. It's not a normal situation. So don't be worried um, if that's not the case. So I want to be a priest. Um, I'm in the Episcopal Church. Uh, so yeah, Princeton's kind of a stepping stone uh, to get me to seminary. Uh, but I know a lot of my friends in the social sciences want to go to uh to a professional school, they want to go to graduate school, um, maybe like a specific grad school, like a law school, a med school, a business school. And what's really cool also is like you don't need to study econ to go to business school. Like you don't need to study um, 
you don't need to be like pre-med to go to med school. You can study philosophy. You can study English. You could study Spanish. You can study whatever you want to study. You can still have a really good shot at getting into a top-notch uh, professional school. Um, yeah. So actually, jumping off of what Carolyn just said, I'm a pre-med right now at Princeton. I'm looking to go to medical school after graduation. Probably take a year off, um, do some work uh, in like the public health care sector. Um, so eventually go to grad school, if not medical school, for public health or medical anthropology. Um, and can sort of continue that. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, uh, at Princeton, you do have your concentration. Whether you are involved in the pre-med or pre-health program, you would still have your concentration outside of that. And the pre-med or pre-law or what, whatever it may be is kind of goes around that concentration. So just as you guys said, uh, put it perfectly, uh, but just to make sure uh, to clear up any confusion about that. Um, so great. So um, we are going to uh, go to the next question. The next question says, uh, what is your favorite book slash article you've read in a class at Princeton? I know okay, it's a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> go for it, go for it. I have one, I have one. Cause, so I took... Claudia Johnson's Jane Austen class um, this past fall, which is awesome. And in that class, I had read all Jane Austen in my middle school, early high school, um, but I had not read her Juvenalia, which is her writing from ages 11 to 17, um, which is amazing. It has people getting illegitimately married, and the people are drunk all the time, and it's very dramatic, but still written in a highly Austenian voice, I guess. You can just see the early workings. So I actually just wrote my senior thesis on it, which I turned in yesterday. Um, so Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just like gems like that, like I went into the class thinking like, ah, I got Austin down. But you find things like this that are just, that you didn't know and that are, that then I got, Professor Johnson is my advisor as well and she's like a premier Austin scholar, so um, totally unexpected but totally beautiful. It was great. I think my favorite book, I think it's one that I read in a class last semester for my junior anthropology course, um, sort of introducing us to the discipline and the research methods was Patterns of Culture by Ruth Benedict. Uh, it's sort of a classic anthropological text that introduces the idea of cultural relativism. Uh, and so I think it just really frames the idea of culture very well and understanding human difference and, and um, try to understand how different cultures can come together and making like the world, I think Ruth Hedick says like making the world safe for human difference at one point. Uh, so it was like a really great book to like, ground my, my interest in the, the subject. There are so many. I, I don't know if I could <laughs> pick a, a single one. Um, but, but I took a class last spring called Imagined Languages and it was a team taught class. It had, uh, it, Joshua Katz was one of the professors and he is a classicist, um, but he also does linguistics. And then Michael Gordon is a historian of science. And they taught this class together about how we as people have over centuries invented languages. And we talked about languages from Linear B, which is this ancient Greek form, um, all the way up to Klingon. And one book we read in there was a grammar book about this language from the late 19th century called Volapük, um, and but it was also a novel, and it was a grammar book and a novel in one book, and it was just fascinating. I wouldn't say it's my favorite book that I've read here, but it's um, it's just so out of my my comfort zone of academic study that it was just really exciting to. It was so foreign to me, is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess kind of again, expanding the question um, and leaping off of what Alex said. So I guess like the favorite textbooks that I've interacted with at Princeton is my freshman um, fall. I was really lucky. I got chosen to take part in, a, um, in an experimental introductory German course. So we basically, it was an, a completely online program, a uh, curriculum that was developed by Professor Jamie Rankin, who's just a world-renowned German professor. Um, and it basically prioritizes uh, language learning um, to focus on the top 1,000 words that are used in the German language. 
So instead of learning the words for like all the vegetables and all the fruits and all the farm animals, you learn words you actually need <laughs> um, to to be like, in conversation or to read a scholarly article, for example. Um, and so that was called Derdi Das, and that was just a really great like textbook experience. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, well thank, thank you so much, much for all of those guys. Oh, we're getting some feedback. Okay. Okay. We'll bear with it for the moment. Um, great. Oh, it fixed itself. Perfect. Um, all right. So uh, going on to the next question. Um, the question is uh, from a student who's considering getting a BSE, uh, but is also interested in humanities or social sciences. Uh, so they're asking if there uh, is an ability uh, to change uh, their mind at some point, uh, and then also if they want um, if they want to pursue the sciences um, or if they want to pursue the humanities, uh, whether they'd be able to get uh, certificates across those disciplines. So if anyone wants to talk about anything of that nature. Um, yeah, I think as a person who came in really interested in the sciences and ended up majoring in the social sciences, I think it's definitely very easy um, if you want to take courses in the sciences. Uh, I've taken organic chemistry. I took an immunology course last semester in the molecular biology department, um, and so you know I think it's within your actual like, course schedule. It is definitely possible to juggle those um, those two disciplines, um, and I think that if you want to go into science focused career, like definitely still possible even with being a major in the social sciences. Um, like I said, if I, I'm interested in going to medical school, um, I'm in the social sciences, but still do my I've still completed the pre med requirements I need to. Um, I know a lot of friends who also are pre-med and have majors in Spanish and sociology and religion, um, and so that's really not hindering your ability to do science post-graduation at all. Anyone else? Who... I, I don't feel qualified to answer that. That sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> the certificates are great, uh, a great way to sort of supplement. They don't have to complement your, your work. They can be something very different um, as a way to be a little more like rounded, if you might say, in like in your studies. Um, yeah, in in my in one of my certificates, um, at the once you're a senior, we get together once a week to talk about our theses um, f about medieval studies, and you have you know the usual suspects. There's an Italian major, an English major, a history major, an art major, art history major, but there's also an economics major. So there's definitely the opportunity to do something that doesn't immediately come to mind. Um, if I wanted to do a, a certificate in finance, I could. Yeah. And going along with that, if you are a BSc, you totally still have the opportunity, right, to take classes in the humanities. So for example, this semester I'm in an upper level Latin class, and we got to travel to Italy over spring break. And in the class, sure, there are a lot of classics concentrators. I'm an independent concentrator. There are a couple maybe like religion, a philosophy or two. But there's also an Orphe concentrator and a computer science BSc concentrator. So just because you're a BSc um, or an AB student, that doesn't mean that you can't take upper level courses in the other fields. Great. Um, I think that's fantastic for this question. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so moving on to uh, the next question, we're actually going to actually hit two, two birds with one stone here. Uh, so uh, we have one question in terms of uh, how easy is it to get to know your professors outside of class and is it easy to find an advisor for independent research? And we have another question that uh, asks, can uh, you speak about the senior thesis uh, and referring to the challenges about doing it and the kind of help that is provided? So um, I think we have two uh, seniors here. Uh, if you'd like to talk about your experience uh, with your thesis advisor or just an experience uh, with professors perhaps uh, outside of uh, the classroom. So maybe Elisa should start because she... <laughs> sure, I would be happy to start. So I, I mentioned I turned in my thesis yesterday. Um, so I did an English thesis. I actually have a visual, visual arts senior show as well, but one down, one to go. Um, and my thesis experience in terms of my advisor has just been really, really good. I actually first had um, so the English department, and I think some other departments, you can submit a list of your preferences for advisors, and they'll have sort of a DEPREP who sorts through and designs. 
It's actually my first assignment. She's a wonderful professor, but just for what I was hoping to do, um, which was a critical creative thesis, so part of it was illustrated, um, which she was just not as on board with. But they were really flexible in terms of just reaching out to professors um, who would want to. Um, and I ended up with Professor Johnson, who also happens to be a, a fantastic Austin scholar, Jane Austen scholar. Um, and yeah, she was just really, really, um, it's really cool because I'm, I'm going through critical material and her name comes up all the time as like, oh, as Professor Johnson said in this magazine, or just like books that are edited by her. Um, could be really intimidating, but when I go into office hours and I'm like, here is what I'm thinking about and what I'm excited about, she's just as behind it as like any idea um, that comes across in the literature. Um, and she challenges it just as much, um, which is good because she just treats, treats you as a legitimate thinker and a le legitimate writer, um, while also just making jokes and um, uh, encouraging the work that you do, giving really good feedback, um, and just pushing you to um, think and to write in a way that um, really uses what you've learned these four years to create a work that you're going to be um, just really pleased with and want to show, want to show your advisor, want to show your friends. Um, and that you feel is a good reflection of um, your ability to work. In terms of the, the process of writing a thesis, fall is really fun. The last two weeks have been not as fun. But you can piece it out better <laughs> than I did. Um, it's totally, it's, it's a lot of self-motivation, which, which is very good to find a topic that you really like. And I really did like in my subject. Um, and so I would say that's very important to do something that you enjoy. It'll make, um, you'll probably stay in the, library a lot, but you'll enjoy that time in the library not sleeping. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm about to hit that two weeks, those last two, week, two weeks of my thesis, but I'm here, I'm smiling, so it's, yeah. it's nothing to worry about. Um, I, my relationship with my advisor is fantastic. Um, now that I think about it, his class my freshman fall was the first class I went to on the first day of school. So it's all coming full circle. It's beautiful. I'm going to get emotional soon. Um, <laughs> and he's really been more than just a great uh, academic advisor. He's been a, an intellectual friend and a life coach. Um, he's helped me apply to grad school. Um, I spent this past Thanksgiving with him and his family. Um, like I went to Thanksgiving lunch at their house. Um, I've gotten to know his wife and his daughter really well, and um, yeah. And the Italian department is really small, so I was given the choice to, to out of the, all the professors in the department, they just asked me, "Who do you want to work with, and what do you want to work on?" And they were incredibly accommodating. Um, and my advisor, Simone Marchesi, just helps me with whatever whatever it is I want to do. He, he runs with it. So it's, it's been really great. That's awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, so the next question that uh, I'd like to talk about is um, study abroad. Um, so w what kind of study abroad programs are available in the humanities? Uh, so if I'm not sure, have any of you guys uh, studied abroad and would uh, perhaps uh, like to talk about your experience? Yeah. I'm, Jake, you have. Jake, you can go first. Okay. Um, so I've actually spent both of my summers so far at Princeton Abroad, and I'm going to spend my third summer abroad as well doing senior thesis research and internship. But I'll speak to the first two um, first because they're a little more applicable to the humanities. So I took German as a freshman and sophomore to fill my language requirement and through the German department. I spent my first summer doing Princeton in Munich, which was an amazing month in Munich. It was actually a Princeton course, so I got like course credit for it to complete the, the language requirement. We basically spent a month um, traveling with the Princeton professor, like having class every day, um, really get a chance to like, interact with the community and the culture while also learning the language. And I loved it so much that I went back to Germany and spent two months working at a hospital in Berlin um, last summer, and that was also, again, funded by the German department through their summer work program. Uh, and that was a chance to build language skills and also try something that was maybe similar to what I wanted to do post-graduation. Uh, but it was through this, you know, this culture and language department that funded this, um, and that was incredible. Uh, and then this summer I'm going to Johannesburg for two months to do a little different 
uh, global health or like public health NGO work uh, for my senior thesis. So, all amazing and a lot of funding available. So financial burden really um, won't like Princeton doesn't want that to stop you from doing this experience or having that experience. Absolutely, they've sent me to Italy and Spain a grand total of like six or seven times. Oh it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. They they just keep sending me back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, one of um, one of the times, uh, one intercession. Intercession is that week long break we get between the winter, or the, between the fall semester and the spring semester. Um, for one intercession last year, for intercession last year, um, I requested funding to go to Italy uh, to drink coffee, and I wrote one of my junior paper, uh, junior papers on literary coffee shops in Italy, um, and they they were on board with it. They gave me some money, and I went over there and drank coffee in like six or seven different cities in Italy. Um, it was fantastic. And I was there again this past summer, um, two months in Florence, reading these medieval manuscripts of uh, Florentine pilgrims from the 1300s. So, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> I, I didn't do enough, apparently. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> I did one summer. One summer abroad um, in China, doing uh, Princeton in Beijing. So it's kind of similar, I guess, to the German program where um, I did Chinese the first two years here, which is really cool. I, I'm half Chinese, but we didn't really speak at home, so it was really cool to. I got to see some extended relatives there, but also be in an immersion program where you could like literally, literally only speak Chinese for six, eight weeks or something like that, um, but also be able to, the classes and the um, tests and stuff were like pretty intense, like they want you, your Chinese to get better, but also there's time to um, see China, and you're kind of in it with a whole cohort of other people who are like, this is crazy, but also amazing, so um, yeah, I've had a really, I guess I'm not doing anything with my Chinese in particular, but I don't think that makes it any less um, valuable or something that I would like to do. Um, so I did the same program that Jake did in Munich, uh, Princeton in Munich, um, and actually studied in uh, two different countries after that over the summer. So that summer um, after my freshman year, I studied abroad in three countries, and for my own like personal development, I traveled as well, like on the weekends and in between programs. So I traveled to a total of 18 countries in Europe uh, that summer, and that was just a really great experience uh, and something that would never have happened if I hadn't uh, done a study abroad. And I also, I spoke earlier about uh, the Latin class that I was taking that went to Italy over spring break. That was really great. It was 100% covered by the university, plane tickets, um, lodging, food. And, um, and because of such, like, because of the positive experiences that I've had with study abroad, uh, specifically in Germany with Princeton, I've actually applied to a year-long study abroad program uh, that the university does in consortium with other Ivy League schools. Awesome. I, think, I think it's important to, just because none of us have done a semester abroad or a year yeah. abroad yet, um, that's definitely a, a possibility. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of friends that have done that, uh, some in Italy, some in France, some in Australia, um, you know, to learn the language. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, but it, it's really seamless. Um, it, Princeton makes it very easy. Um, to spend a semester or a year abroad. And they encourage it, too, to yeah. get yeah. out there. Awesome. Well, I had no idea we were in the midst of such well-seasoned travelers. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so uh, it, we're at about the 40-minute mark uh, now, so I think we'll move on to our final question. Um, so we had touched on this um, when you were talking about your study abroad experiences in terms of, uh, um, oh, I mean, uh, in terms of previous when we were talking about uh, some of the professors you've worked with and uh, how you came to your concentration that uh, either you are uh, wrapping up now or in the, in the throes of it or are uh, um, kind of reaching that, starting that process. Um, but we have a question that asks, uh, if there was a specific class that helped you decide what you would like to study at Princeton, um, 
or if you just knew as soon as you before you came to Princeton, you were just certain. Uh, I think Carolyn, you had mentioned uh, something of that nature, uh, but uh, perhaps there was a class that really reinforced uh, what you were thinking. So, uh, if we want to wrap up with that last question of uh, perhaps that really influential class in your Princeton experience. Yeah. Don't quote me on it, um, but there's some statistic at something like like 75% of students will change their concentration or change their major in college, and I really didn't want to be in that 75%. Um, I really wanted to be the 25%. I really wanted to be the minority. Came into Princeton really gung ho about studying religion, and I was really happy in that concentration. I think I would still be very happy in that concentration, but actually it was a class last semester. Um, it was called, it's a comparative literature course called Stolen Years, Youth Under Nazis in World War II with Professor Froma Zeitlin. And that class uh, just really made it very clear to me uh, that I really want to be a Holocaust scholar. I really want to do um, work that's, that's meaningful not only in academia, but also um, to people, uh, to real people. And I think that that class really gave me the confidence, it gave me the mentorship that I, that I needed. Um, to know that that was a possibility for me. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to see what the next two years of my Princeton career will look like and hopefully an academic career um, after that. Yeah, I also came in thinking I wanted to do history or politics. Um, and as it turns out, history and politics are definitely involved in my thesis um, and they've informed my entire time here. Um, but it was a class I took freshman fall, the first class I went to on the first day of school, um, that was on I Italian singer-songwriters in the 20th century. Um, and the professor was, as I've said, fantastic. Um, and I liked the class so much that I told him, I'm going to take whatever class you teach until my time here at Princeton is done. And I did. Yeah, I, I took all the classes this professor offers to the point where he and I designed our own class we wrote the syllabus together. Um, so that, that one class really put me in touch with this scholar that I, I wouldn't have come into Princeton thinking I'm going to major in medieval Italian literature. But he taught this class. I took his class the following semester, which was on Giovanni Boccaccio, um, this 14th century Italian writer. And that just, I, I was down the rabbit hole. I, I came in. Um thinking I wanted to be an English major and a visual arts minor, and that's kind of what I'm leaving doing. So. <laughs> um, but I will say that there have been classes that I, um, in terms of just sort of what they presented, that I didn't expect going in. And even classes, um, I guess we haven't talked much, but there are like distribution requirements outside of your major as well. So with that, I've been able to take courses such as like, um, one of my favorites is social psychology, um, I did a journalism course, too, which is kind of an offshoot of English, but also very different. Um, so while I guess I have kind of stuck to the plan, I, I found a lot of classes that have definitely affirmed that. I've been in courses and been like, oh, this is so good. Um, but I've also been sort of encouraged to branch out to other courses as well. So I haven't just stuck to that and found those really fulfilling as well. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier in this, this hangout, um, I came in as a science major. And it wasn't until my like middle of my sophomore year, or sort of first half, of the, sometime in the first half of the sophomore year, that I even discovered what anthropology was. Uh, it was through a major choices trip through my residential college. Uh, we went one Saturday to the Penn Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology, and actually went to that trip just because I was taking a class on Princeton and slavery, and we looked at Princeton's archives and its relationship to the institution, and um, they were having the, the show of the Morton Skull Collection down at the museum and I was writing about ideas of scientific racism in the early and late 1800s and so I went to see that. But then I learned what anthropology was and I was like, wow, this is something that might be a really interesting way to capture my interest in both the social sciences but also science. And so I took a class on medical anthropology that next semester with Professor Joao Biel, who's actually my current junior paper advisor now. Um, and it really like sort of changed the way that I looked at sort of understanding medicine as more than like a science but taking into account all the other political, economic, and social factors, and that's really solidified my interest in anthropology. And, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, 
Uh, first, I'd like to thank our four uh, panelists, uh, Alex, Jake, Carolyn, um, and Aisha. Uh, I mean, Elisa, sorry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's late. Elisa, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, my goodness, it's late. Um, so if you have uh, more questions, uh, if, for those of you watching this panel now, or whether you are watching it later, um, Please, please, please reach out to UA Office, uh, all one word, no punctuation, at princeton.edu, uh, and you can email us there, and a mission officer will uh, respond to you there. Um, and also, uh, if you want to uh, follow us uh, or share your admit moment and memories at, uh, at Preview, um, should you be coming to Preview soon, uh, joining us on campus uh, with the hashtag uh, hashtag Princeton 2020 or uh, hashtag Princeton Preview. Uh, we're going to compile all of those. Um, also, we have a class Facebook page uh, for prospective students uh, to connect with the undergraduates. So uh, for all you admitted students out there, uh, we have a Facebook page. And um, you can uh, join that. And we will uh, make sure to double check that uh, you're all set with the class of 2020. And you can uh, interact there. Um, and I would also say, uh, please check out the Admitted Students website for resources on, Prince, uh, on the preview program uh, and just general information uh, about the university. But I think that uh, wraps it up. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you soon at uh, Princeton Preview. And make sure if you see any of our wonderful uh, panelists to to embarrass them and say oh, hello no. and say, I watched you guys. Please say hi. Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Reach out. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, and have a nice night.